second piece of the puzzle in chapter two is electrolyte imbalances. So I'm gonna kind of divide this up into sodium and potassium, which are the major ones, and then other, <laughs> other ones. And um, I have a few case studies that we'll look at um, and some acid-based case studies as well, because that's fun, right? So the major learning objectives for electrolyte imbalances are signs, causes, signs, and effects of electrolyte imbalances. So the um, causes and signs and effects of really the main ones we're looking at are sodium and potassium. And then what are the implications of electrolyte imbalances for physical therapy? That's pretty important to know. So sodium is the primary extracellular cation. Cations are the positively charged ones. And potassium is the primary intracellular um, cation. So there's a lot of sodium in the blood and in the extracellular fluids and not as much potassium. And there's a lot of potassium inside the cell and not as much sodium. So, you know, we'll talk about what the deal is with that later. Um, calcium is going around doing a lot of different jobs. So it's inside the cell, it, the calcium levels can be variable. Not that much calcium in the blood at any given time. And um, and then we'll talk about um, bicarbonate in with regard to acid-base balances. But lots of um, electrolytes are basically dissolved ions, charged ions that are dissolved in water. And remember, water is our um, medium for everything in the body. So electrolytes move between compartments just like fluid moves between compartments. And in fact, electrolytes sometimes drive the movement of fluid. So one of the sort of rules of thumb of fluid and electrolyte movement is that water follows sodium. So if you're getting rid of sodium, you're getting rid of water. If you're retaining sodium, you're retaining water. So water follows sodium, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so sodium is the primary cation in the extracellular fluid. It diffuses between vascular and interstitial fluids. Transport It's transported in and out of the cells actively using ATP for energy um, by a sodium and potassium pump. So we have an ATP powered pump that actively transports sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell to maintain the chemical gradients that we need to do things like nerve impulses. Um, sodium is actively secreted into mucus and other secretions. So like your tears taste salty because sodium is there. Um, probably most of our body fluids taste salty, but I don't know, there's some body fluids you just don't wanna taste, right? But in the olden days, um, that used to be, um, doctors used to taste stuff, ick, right? We don't do that now, thank goodness. But um, sometimes, you know, you taste your own sweat or tears. <laughs> Hopefully not during an exam. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so sodium exists in the form, um, when it's an ion, it's dissolved in water. Um, but when it's solid, it exists in the form of sodium chloride and sodium bicarbonate. And so you saw on that list that chloride and bicarbonate were um, some of the anions, the negative ions, and a lot of times they're hanging out with sodium. Not always. Um, sodium is ingested in food and beverages. And, and you know, salt, sodium chloride in food makes food taste better. <laughs> that's that's one of the things salt does, or it enhances other flavors. So one of the reasons we put salt on our food is because it makes it taste better. As long as you don't do too much, it's okay. Um, hyponatremia. So the, the chemical symbol for sodium is Na. And um, so hyponatremia is low sodium in the blood. So hypo is low, nat is sodium, and emia is the blood, so low blood sodium level. Um, hyponatremia can be caused from excessive sweating because we're sweating out sodium with our sweat. Vomiting or diarrhea 
because we're losing fluids and fluids and electrolytes go together. Um, use of certain diuretic drugs combined with a low salt diet. So a lot of times people are on diuretic drugs for cardiac issues, and they also want you to be on a low salt diet for cardiac issues. So often your doctor, if you're on those medications, um, your doctor's gonna monitor on a fairly regular basis, your sodium level, usually not more than once or twice a year, but um, your sodium level and your potassium level, because um, if you're losing if those diuretic drugs, you're losing more fluid, you're also losing sodium. So there are some diuretic drugs that spare sodium and lose potassium. There's some that spare potassium and lose sodium. And um, you and your doctor can decide based on what your values are, which one you need. Um, hormonal imbalances can cause hyponatremia. Um, in, insufficient aldosterone, um, adrenal insufficiency, or excess antidiuretic hormone secretion. Diuresis, where you're taking a diuretic specifically to get rid of fluid, because when you get rid of fluid, you get rid of sodium. Um, excessive water intake can cause hyponatremia. Um, if you just drink too much water, there's such a thing. So everything's Goldilocks, right? Not too much, not too little, just right. You want the just right amount. So I don't know what um, constitutes excessive water intake, but it probably takes a good deal of effort to get there. So if you have hyponatremia for one of those reasons, um, low sodium levels cause fluid imbalance in the compartments. Um, and that's never good, right? So now we're messing up with homeostasis. Um, and as a consequence of that fluid imbalance, you can get fatigue, muscle cramps, abdominal discomfort or cramps, and nausea and vomiting, which then causes more problems because you're losing more fluids and electrolytes. Um, decreased osmotic pressure in the extracellular fluid compartment ca can cause a fluid shift into the cells um, because you don't have that pulling pressure to pull it out of the cells. And um, that the fluid shift into the cells causes hypovolemia and decreased blood pressure. Because if it's not in the, um, if it more goes into the cells, you're getting it out of the um, intravascular compartment. Um, it can also cause cerebral edema, which is very serious and cause uh, confusion, headache, weakness, and possibly seizures. Never good. So, um, Hyponatremia and fluid shift into cells. This is the um, basically the little um, diagram. So the water shifts out of the blood, um, low osmotic pressure in, in the extracellular fluids causes low sodium concentration in the blood um, and more water shifts into the cells because it goes from low to high osmotic pressure. Um, and the cells swell and it decreases their function and it could even rupture the cells. So that's never good. 10th grade biology, did you do that osmotic pressure experiment where you have the semipermeable membrane and different solutions? I don't know. I don't know what's going on in 10th grade biology these days. I remember my 10th grade biology teacher, Mrs. Hilton. She was wonderful. I wonder if she's still around. Oh, anyway, sorry. Hypernatremia. <laughs> Um, so hyper, too much, nat, sodium, emia, in the blood. Um, so it's an imbalance, imbalance of um, sodium and water. So if you have insufficient antidiuretic hormone, that is also known as diabetes insipidus. It results in a large volume of dilute urine. So you, you um, lose a lot of water and you keep your sodium. So you have too much sodium. Um, it depresses your thirst mechanism or a, a depression of your thirst mechanism can cause hypernatremia because you're not getting enough water to dilute it. Um, watery diarrhea because you're losing water. So you can kind of see that hypernatremia and dehydration might kind of go hand in hand. Um, prolonged periods of rapid respiration um, and ingestion of large amounts of sodium without enough water. Um, the reason that prolonged periods of rapid respiration cause hypernatremia is because the sodium that is um, together with uh, bicarbonate ion, and bicarbonate ion um, is exhaled as 
carbon dioxide in the lungs. So if you're breathing, if you have a prolonged period of rapid respiration, you're getting rid of a lot of um, carbon dioxide. So you have excess sodium in your blood. Weird, right? So the little um, diagrams are from a, a nursing website that has little ways to remember all these. You don't have to remember those. I just think they're cute. Um, so hypernatremia can cause weakness, agitation, rough, dry mucous membranes. Remember, hypernatremia and dehydration go together, rough, dry mucous membranes. Um, but edema, so like that's the opposite. It <laughs> doesn't make sense. But um, increased thirst, if, if you still have a thirst mechanism, if your thirst mechanism is not functional, that could cause hypernatremia um, and increased blood pressure. And the sign, that's another one of those little goofy mnemonics for remembering them. So potassium is the major intracellular cation. Um, low, low in the blood serum, and there's a narrow range that it has to be in, um, and high within the cells. Um, potassium is also ingested in foods and excreted primarily in the urine, just like sodium. Um, insulin promotes movement of potassium into cells. Insulin also promotes movement of glucose into cells. So I always think of insulin as helping things get into the cells. Um, so potassium is one of those things that helps get into the cells. Um, and then we also have that sodium potassium pump that pumps um, out two sodiums and in one potassium for every molecule of ATP that it uses. Um, the level of potassium can be influenced by the acid-base balance. Um, excess potassium ions in the interstitial fluid can lead to hyperkalemia. Um, hyperkalemia is not good. So the um, chemical symbol for potassium is K. So cal, hyperkalemia. Um, hyper, too much, cal, potassium, emia, blood. <laughs> and so that's uh, our hyperkalemia. Abnormal potassium levels can um, cause changes in cardiac conduction and are life-threatening. So um, the probably the most dangerous electrolyte imbalance is potassium imbalance because it can cause cardiac arrhythmias that can kill you. So um, potassium imbalance is very serious. So here's our little chart comparing hypo and hyperkalemia. So both of them can cause cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. So if your potassium is too low or too high, that's a huge problem. Um, anorexia, which is loss of appetite, nausea and constipation, um, and the opposite, nausea and diarrhea for hyperkalemia. Um, they both cause muscle um, weakness, paralysis, or twitching depending on whether it's hypo or hyper, because it affects nerve conduction. So that could cause problems with, um, if you're trying to do physical activity in rehab with this person, um, if they have their potassium levels are out of balance, they might not be appropriate for um, therapy today. Uh, shallow respirations and paresthesis, which is twitching or tingling in the, um, in the extremities and so hyper or hypo can cause paresthesias. Um, postural hypotension, polyuria, which is a lot of urination, and nocturia, which is urinating at night. Um, oliguria is not producing any urine for hyperkalemia, so that's not good. Um, so serum pH level is um, elevated with hypokalemia, um, it's alkalosis, and we'll talk about this in the next section. Um, and with hyperkalemia, serum pH is decreased with acidosis. So they're all bad. Those are all bad things. Um, hypo and hyperkalemia are very serious. That having been said, more people are admitted to the hospital for sodium imbalances than for potassium imbalances. So the causes of um, hypokalemia so if your serum potassium level is less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter, it's the um, unit, um, it, causes, it can be caused by, that's hypokalemia, can be caused by excessive losses of potassium caused by diarrhea, diuresis associated with um, some diuretic drugs, the ones that don't spare potassium, 
um, excessive aldose, aldosterone or glucocorticoids. Um, Cushing syndrome is a um, an endocrine disorder, which we'll talk about later, that um, can cause it. Um, decreased dietary intake of potassium. So that may occur with people with eating disorders or alcoholism or starvation. Um, so the, a lot of times people who have anorexia nervosa, which is an eating disorder where they don't eat, um, often die of cardiac arrhythmias because of hypokalemia. Um, treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis with insulin can cause hypokalemia because insulin helps potassium go into the cells and out of the blood. So you get a lower blood level of potassium. So the effects, cardiac dysrhythmias, that's a problem. <laughs> Interference with neuromuscular function, that's a problem which may make them inappropriate. Both cardiac dysrhythmias and interference with neuromuscular function can make them inappropriate for therapy. Um, paresthesia is that pins and needles feeling in your hands and feet. Decreased, decreased digestive tract motility. But with severe hypokalemia, you could get shallow respirations and failure to concentrate urine. So that's the large volume of dilute urine or polyuria. That also happens with um, type 1 diabetes. So um, hyperkalemia is a serum potassium level of greater than five milliequivalents per liter. Um, it can be caused by renal failure. It can be caused, it can be caused by a deficit of aldosterone or potassium sparing diuretics because it's not getting rid of the potassium um, in the kidneys. Um, so a lot of times those salt substitutes that you'll see in the grocery store um, are instead of sodium chloride, they're potassium chloride. So if a person is on a potassium sparing diuretic, they need to not use salt substitutes because um, they don't want to add potassium to their diet because they're already not excreting it. Um, leakage of intracellular potassium into the extracellular cellular space with extensive tissue damage, um, that could be a cause of hyperkalemia. And displacement of potassium from cells um, by prolonged or severe acidosis. So lots of different things can cause um, electrolyte imbalances. And a lot of times the medical treatments to treat the cause, not to treat the imbalance. And it's the same thing with acid-base imbalances. Um, you're going to treat the cause. So the effects of hyperkalemia um, are the most dangerous electrolyte imbalance effect, which is cardiac dysrhythmias that can lead to cardiac arrest. Muscle weakness is common, progressing to paralysis, and that may cause respiratory arrest and impaired neuromuscular activity, as well as fatigue, nausea, and paresthesias. So usually someone with hyper or hypokalemia is not appropriate for therapy. So um, that is that is a, your big takeaway for hypo and hyperkalemia. Okay, in the next section, we'll talk about calcium and the other electrolytes, and then we'll look at a couple of case studies.